Lovely to see you all here. Uh, uh, my name is Johannes Schoberg. I'm part of the VR at Manchester steering group. And uh, this is Keith Myers. Uh, and he's going to talk to us today for one hour and 15 minutes. It's a bit longer at this event than usual. Uh, about the possibilities of immersive technologies uh, generally. And this event is supported by uh, not only VR Manchester and the uh, innovation community, but also uh, by Matthew Thomas from the Digital Futures Platform. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Keith. Uh, he's been working as an independent uh, virtual media practitioner, uh, virtual reality practitioner about five years. And for the last couple of years, he has been helping us to teach our VR course at Manchester as uh, at Drama as well. Uh, now, uh, just to set you up with a basic uh, um, um, logistics here. So instead of uh, questions at the end, after one hour and 15 minutes, we are going to ask you to just send mess uh, questions in the chat uh, uh, continuously and then at the end I will just ask those questions to uh, to Keith and he will answer them as part of the Q&A. So lovely to see you all here and Keith please. Brilliant good morning everyone thanks for coming I really appreciate your time this morning and thanks for that great introduction Johannes uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, I just want to make sure, can you hear my audio all right, Johannes? Is that, is that coming through loud and clear? Brilliant, excellent. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll give an opportunity for question and answers um, at the end. I think um, it'd be interesting if, if we allow people to um, come back in any, any questions as well. Um, I'm going to load up the presentation, just set a timer, just so I know where we are in terms of the presentation. So just bear me one second while I share my screen. Okay, so um, this lecture series, this masterclass is um, titled The Transformative Power of Immersive Technology. And as rightly Yanis introduced me, I've been um, in this field for approximately five years now. So the primary goal today really is to introduce you, um, maybe practitioners and non-practitioners into the technology of immersive, te immersive technology, and also look at some um, real world examples, um, some of the projects that I've worked on, um, but also looking at the wider field and uh, really thinking about what's happening um, in, in the world of immersive technology. Um, so this is quite a broad uh, outline of what we're looking at. Um, however, I've, I've put this together in, in segments, really. So we're going to look at um, what, what the new medium is, really. And then we're going to move on, um, start looking at theories on immersive embodiment. Um, what do we mean by, um, be, mean by that? I'm going to show you some examples. And then also... I'm going to introduce you, maybe for some of the people attending today, how you can actually create your own immersive experiences if there's something you want to test out. Um, perhaps you've got a little R&D project or perhaps you're just um, you're curious, inquisitive in what you can actually do. And then we're going to look at some of the, the case studies and uh, kind of R&D stuff that I've been working on. And I, I believe there's some colleagues um, here from uh, Manchester Met as well. I've seen, seen the list. So um, some of you might be familiar with um, some of the um, information that I bring in later on as well. And then we're going to look at um, a little bit on what I'm, what I'm interested in as well, and kind of my own practice um, as an artist and the, the technology, what I find really interesting, really. Um, and then we're going to move on to the way the industry is changing. And finally, um, a little section on Q and A. So a little bit, a little bit more about me. So I, I trained as a photographer. Um, I actually graduated from Manchester Met as a as a filmmaker, and that's where I did my undergrad. Um, and I've been operating um, in the immersive sector um, ever since. And I was I was doing that before actually leaving. Um, at grad school and doing doing these kind of things, these um, virtual reality um, experiments and trying to make work in this field. And then I sort of moved into um, more, I guess, um, scientific theory around 
um, what is VR and computer science and this kind of stuff. And as an artist, that's I think that's very very challenging to actually do, and um, it's still not my my forte, so to speak. But um, with uh, Hammer, I've, I've basically hammered in enough code into my brain um, to be able to actually work out how to use games engine technology, how to code, and um, how to actually um, get into this this industry really. And, and pretty much anyone can do that. It's just um, perseverance is really the key. Um, and then I formed a company um, to actually enable me to do more of this type of work. And it, it just it gives me a bit more of a presence and enables me to test out some more of the R&D kind of things. And some of the sectors I've worked in include healthcare, heritage, um, the environment, um, education, training, fashion, and I guess art, arts in general, really. Um, my passion, my personal passion is history. So that's why I'm kind of interested in uh, heritage and what we can actually achieve with this technology. And I think there's an amazing wealth um, of, of talent in this country and there's amazing, um, so much amazing heritage in this country that um, we can actually be world leaders in, in this sector. Oh, so, okay, so the power of a new medium, um, what, what do we actually mean um, by this technology? Um, what do we mean by immersive? I think that's a very um, on-point um, way of actually thinking about this and framing this technology. It sounds um, to the non-sort of descriptive um, that to be immersed is to kind of be dipped into some sort of fluid or something. Um, but actually what we're talking about is we're referring to technology that attempts to emulate the physical world um, around us. So using um, computer technology really to surround us um, in another environment. Um, and then we can start thinking about ways in which we can elicit different, different sensations from this technology. I'm going to come on to um, what those type of technologies are now. So yes, it's really sense of immersion. But what do we mean by the, the technologies? Um, well, we're not just limited to the examples in, in this um, presentation. The probably the most um, easy example, if you like, that we go to is virtual reality. So actually donning a v VR headset, a head-mounted display device. Probably that's what we, we kind of think of with this technology, and that's uh, specifically virtual reality. But we've got other things as well, like um, augmented reality, um, which is uh, in its basic form is overlaying a digital environment over the real world. There's, there's quite a bit of contentious debate about what those those technologies are in terms of augmented reality and mixed reality. I guess the best way I could frame mixed reality is kind of a mix um, between augmented and, and, and virtual um, using real world world haptic feedbacks and we start thinking about uh, Microsoft HoloLens and this kind of thing. But in actual fact, what we can actually use as well, another technology is 360 film. And it's a really in easy and interesting entry point to this technology. But beyond beyond the headset, beyond the, um, the phone in, in your hands, we can start thinking about performative elements because uh, immersive doesn't necessarily have to, although we're uh, focusing on technology today, it doesn't necessarily have to be about technology. It can be an immersive theatre experience. And this was a sector that was doing very well until the pandemic hit us. And uh, so we had things like the Great Gatsby experience in London, Punch Drunk were doing things in Manchester. And these are the kind of experiences that are um, audience participatory, participatory led. So um, interaction um, with a, a play or, excuse me, something that's been planned in advance. Um, other types of technology um, can include um, projection mapping onto a space, so that is using literally project projectors onto a space. Um, we start thinking about what the pandemic's given us in terms of accessibility to, to the technology as well. These um, interactive web experiences, you can go to um, virtual galleries now. Um, you have a lot of this kind of um, immersive term that's been banded about at the moment. And then we can start thinking about telepresence for zoom and social vr don't think the definitions um quite there with with for example um zoom but we'll move on to that in a moment and this is just a, a slide an example this is a company called team lab um a tokyo based i believe of the the open day um immersive exhibition space 
in Tokyo, and then I think New York they expanded to, and they had one in uh, the Netherlands somewhere as well. And these are uh, projected environments where you can actually physically walk around an immersive space. So what they're actually using here is, um, I believe, mirrors on, on the floor and projecting um, upwards and reflecting down. So when you actually walk through this environment, you have this sort of digital um, world that you're walking through. And that's a really interesting way we can start thinking about immersive technology without actually putting on a physical headset. So I think that's kind of interesting, but their business case or business model rather has probably been hit really hard with the pandemic, I would imagine, um, because you have to physically enter these spaces. But it can be audio, audio as well. It doesn't have to be a physical digital space like this. It could be audio as well. We can create a great, great immersive experiences just by using clever audio. Um, but where, where does the term virtual reality come from? Uh, Jaron Lanier, or Jaron, I don't know how you say his name. It's an American way of saying it. But um, he coined the, coined the term in around 1989, depending on what you read, to describe the experience made possible by the use of latest generation of goggles, gloves, and related technologies. So he's kind of seen as... Um, a bit of a cultural theorist around virtual reality. But then you have other people as well who are making comments on this, such as Pierre Levy writing that VR was too important to um, continue disciplinary ignorance of, of the medium. Um, and he's he's a French philosopher and media theorist as well. So if you're interested in, um, I guess, more of the kind of academic background and people in writing about this technology, those are two people to um, look into, I, I would say. And if we want to deep dive a little bit more, then we can start thinking about um, the concept of reality. Um, I think virtual reality or immersive, immersive environments um, created by immersive mm -hmm. technology kind of allow us to start thinking about um, sort of ontological questions around um, who, who we are and where we're going and what, what it means to be um, in, in a world, a simulated world, um, because of arguably because of the advent of these technologies, uh, a lot of people are beginning to question uh, the nature of reality even further, and, and some theorists believe that there could be um, there could be some sort of simulation going on, and you start getting into theories of um, a simulated universe. But I mean, I mean, come on, where where do we want to go with this kind of stuff? But it's really interesting to think about. I think um, as a researcher myself, to frame uh, my own understanding of of the technology. Um, it's it's really have, interesting to have that contextual background. Um, I guess coming from a filmmaking and art school background, um, having that way of thinking around this technology um, really allows us to start pulling the strings of the, of the technology and what it is that it can allow us to do. Um, we start thinking about things like um, Plato's cave, the allegory of the cave, um, which if you're not familiar with it, is this kind of idea that and there's another reality outside the cave and, and and if we left this this reality that we're in now and that we we would no longer be recognizable to our contemporaries in terms of what we've what we've seen and witnessed they wouldn't believe us because they would literally be experiencing the world through um, shapes and shadows on, on a cave wall um, so that's kind of a, an interesting um, allegory into this kind of way of thinking with this technology it stimulates us to try and think about what is possible and what we can actually um, start trying to make. And there's a little video there. I won't, I won't play that little example, but um, reading Plato is just, I mean, fantastic anyway. And, and reading around this kind of stuff is, is really interesting. Um, and that, that's where we can kind of deep dive on this, this technology, I think. Um, a really interesting book on virtual art and the origins of this technology. And believe it or not, we've kind of come a long way with, with this technology already. We've arguably, arguably had um, the capacity and technology, at least, to immerse ourselves in, in art. And um, these go back to, and, they, and in this book particularly, makes uh, references to and provides examples of the rotundas where you could actually physically walk into these art spaces. And these are really interesting um, ways of actually physically entering a painting. Uh, so there's the the, uh, the the sedan battle, I think it is, in um, which is a, I believe off the top of my head was a, 
a um, Prussian um, campaign uh, way back, and it's uh, commemorated in this rotunda where you can actually physically walk into the space. But there's also these other illusion spaces as well that it makes reference to in this book, and it's just a fantastic book if you're interested in trying to understand where this art form comes from. And like I say, it's, it's not just now with this technology. It's, it's got its origins um, back, you know, at least a couple of thousand years, really. So I would, I would recommend a, a little look into that one if you're interested in that. But why should we care about this technology? Um, some people might be familiar with this example, this hyper-reality by Kichi Matsuda. Um, and this is... and. I don't know whether you're going to actually hear the sound here, but I'll try. Uh, Johannes, maybe you can tell me if you can't hit the, hear the sound of this. I, I can it, hear it. You can hear it, great. No, it comes and goes. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, uh, no, yeah. no problem. Uh, I can you, just give a bit of dialogue with that. That's you, fine. Uh, click uh, share computer on your view options yeah okay so what i can do actually is i can i've got a, a um a screen with this prepared on on a web link so i'll go to the web link i'll see if this makes um any difference you have to share the sound of your computer Dave. all right okay here we go is 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 where the zoom apologies everyone there's where the zoom things come in now um so share the audio yeah, you go to. Uh... <laughs> I don't. I never share the audio like this. Anyway, no. it's okay. It's all right. You can go to. You you can go to. Uh, just stop sharing now, and then go to share your screen again. And then when you share your screen, there's an option. It's just asking you whether you want to share the audio. Ah, very good. Whoever that was, um, that was brilliant. No, no es lo que quiero decir. ¿Para dónde voy? No. Puedo volver a empezar. Olvídalo. Estoy presente ahora. Me amo. Estoy libre de mi ira. Estoy libre de mi tristeza. El amor es mi tristeza. Adiós. So I'm going, to, I'm going to pause it there. Um, the reason why I was showing you that example, I got slightly distracted then because this um, screen share issue. Uh, but the reason why I was showing you that example is because um, I wanted to frame uh, the possible uh, future. Um, that kind of looks like a bit of a nightmare to me, but the possible future where we could be heading um, with this kind of, of technology in terms of um, its use. Um, so that's kind of um, using, or, or obviously using augmented reality. But um, it's using it in such a way as to, I would say, overwhelm us, overwhelm our senses. Um, it's not necessarily what we want to um, have in the in the future. Um, just going to share my screen again. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a nightmare situation. I mean, if Apple's glasses are a thing, which we'll come on to, and if in uh, later on in the presentation, then we might end up ed heading in that direction. Hopefully not. Um, so. I think one of the most interesting things for me as an artist and a creator in this space is what uh, I would describe as the strongest aspects of this technology. Yeah, um, oh. I mean, of the air sound. Yeah. That's it. Is it? Um... It's it stopped. Okay. Sorry about that. So. Um, right. I think there's someone talking in the background as well. Um, can you hear? Uh, Keith, 
You're also on mute now. <laughs> Push on. Right. Mute. Okay. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. It's fine. All right. Okay. So, um, the reason why I was showing showing that example was um, to give you framing around the technology, um, and actually show you a, a way that uh, the world could, could become a bit of a nightmare with augmented reality. The strong aspect of um, immersive technology, what it can allow us to do. Yeah, and now it's gone. So there's something as soon yes, as you... when I go to share screen, right? Share like that. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. It's fine. It's no, okay. no music in the background. It's fine. Yeah, it's the option to share screen. Okay. So, right. I'll try again. Please, please bear with me. So, um, what is embodiment in immersive technology? So, the four strongest things I would say are simulation, immersion, interaction, and embodiment. So the, the strongest of those aspects, I would argue, are, uh, or is embodiment. So it allows us to create a connection um, with the, the audience um, and it allow, uh, sorry, the, the protagonist in the story. I'm going to show you an example in a moment. Maybe I'll kill the audio on that um, of um, an experience whereby we can create, create these immersive experiences and actually allow us to feel like we're actually in that space or we're actually made to feel like we are that person. And the example uh, I was going to show which I'm not that sure now about showing, but I'm, I'm going to do it um, because I think I've, I've sussed it out now. Um, but it's um, a, a an experience called I Walk Through Dementia. And that experience um, is, uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to stick to this presentation, actually. But the link's there. So it's a walk through dementia. And what that experience is, is that you're an elderly lady walking through um, an experience and you've got dementia and your son's trying to guide you and essentially what that's doing that experience is tapping into this idea of embodiment that you're actually another person in this experience and that's where the strength um, really lies with this type of technology i would say um and then there's another really interesting example um called square pusher store eagles which is again using this idea of being another character in a space and making you feel like um, you're actually somebody else so this is another example this is also available on youtube you can if you do have a vr headset you can watch this as well i think towards the end if you've got a bit of time i can try and play some of these examples i think that's probably the, the best thing to do because i don't want this audio issue occurring again um, but again this is um really a really strong example of this idea of embodiment. And I think that's one of the strongest things for me about immersive technology. Um, and another example on that, a recent um, experience that, that I tried out is traveling while black. And this is kind of even taking that further, I would argue with the idea that you're um, sort of connecting with, with empathy with that person that you, you are embodying that experience, but this is kind of done in a way um, that allows you to uh, get a sense of, of what racism was like in, in America at a particular time. Obviously, there's still issues today, but um, this is looking at, I think it's around the 50s or 60s, um, and it's looking at how we can actually overcome kind of societal issues and um, where we've come um, as, as, I guess, a, a race of people um, so far with, with this um issue of racism really so I, I would recommend trying that one out as well so another thing uh, with this uh, immersive technology the use of virtual reality um, allows us to um, be in another space as well so the idea here is that um, pure telepresence is the idea that you're controlling another figure or another robot in another space so you're actually being beamed into another space but we can start to elicit these these ideas of um, telepresence and being in, an, in another space using the humble um, webcam for example how many times do we hear now that um, we're going to a virtual event everything's virtual and the reason for that is because we're facing this pandemic situation but really what we're doing we're actually using technology that's been around for about 
at least 20 years, I would say, this uh, webcam technology. It's just the terminology shifting a little bit. And I think that's also true of, of immersive as well, um, because we've been forced to think about things a little bit differently and people want to be able to access events and um, actually be able to go and see different things. Um, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we're not always able to do that. So some of these these ideas around telepresence, um, like having social experiences, we've got here, uh, alt space VR, top left, um, and then the bottom left, and we've got Zoom webinars that we're, we're kind of having today. And then we've got VR chat, and VR chat and uh, alt space are allowing you to go to ticketed events as a community online using a headset, a VR headset. So it's allowing uh, social interaction, although obviously it's not quite the same um, but it's kind of as close as we're going to get really at the moment um, and then i've put this example on the top right as well i just think it's an interesting way of thinking about contextual issues and, and popular media um, this film is uh, surrogates which is um, stars bruce willis um, amongst other actors and it's a really interesting film because it's kind of this idea of um, that we're going to be controlling robots in the future and we're going to actually be sat inside these these robotic characters that are going to, I don't know, walk to the shop and get us a loaf of bread or something like that. But it kind of goes a bit beyond that without spoiling the film. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I'd certainly recommend having a look into that. How can we make immersive experiences? So for the creators amongst you, um, really easy entry way um, we can create immersive experiences is to use 360 camera technology. And um, these are just some of the cameras that are on the market. Personally, I'm familiar with about uh, nearly all of them. The only one I've not used now is the GoPro Max, I think. Um, some of these are quite, quite, quite old now, a few years old. So we've got the first iteration of Samsung Gear. Then we have the 4K Samsung Gear 2, Kodak Pix Pro. And then we've got really sort of um, the powerful cameras that I use, um, which is the Insta Pro 2 and this kind of stuff. And that's allowing you to record stereoscopic virtual reality uh, 360 film. So there's a, there is a difference between the type of 360 film you record as well. But these these sort of early cameras, Samsung Gear is a really interesting entry point to creating um, virtual reality experiences yourself. And it's not that difficult to do. Um, some of this, the audio as well, likewise, uh, we can use some of the devices like the Zoom HR3, which I've used, and these these uh, really clever um, devices called the Xyla. They're kind of trying to simulate um, the, the shape of your ear and this kind of stuff and add this kind of ambisonic sound to your production. So this uh, technologies are emerging and getting better all the time. But actually, um, if you are interested in taking that a step further, then you can use Unreal um, Games Engine or Unity. And these allow you to pretty much create anything in your imagination. Um, all you've got to do is um, take the plunge in that respect. But th those two games engines are re really interesting and way of combining all these camera technology um, as well as CGI and all sorts of other things. Um, and they're kind of being used for virtual production now as well for filmmakers, which we'll come on to later. So some of the, those um, technology are entry level things. And then um, some of the early iterations of the headsets, if you want to experience uh, VR um, and immersive technology, Google Dream, Daydream, which is obsolete now. You can still use Google Cardboard. You just slot your phone in and you can actually experience 360 film. Um, some of the headsets we've used at the University of Manchester, the Oculus Go, um, which are really um, good entry level um experiences you can get on, get on that um oculus have pulled the plug on that and uh, the support for it but you can still use it um and likewise the oculus rift now is becoming slowly obsolete and we've got the quest 2 down here where we are at the moment and these um, are really good because they're allowing us to purchase vr technology for approximately 299 pound whereas a year and a half ago, you had to build a PC for approximately £1,000, maybe more, to actually even use this, this type of VR, this Six Degrees of Freedom VR, which is the Oculus Rift. And then we've got the mixed reality stuff, the, the HoloLens, and this is kind of the, the promised land of um, AR glasses and mixed reality glasses. Uh, I'll come on to that in a moment. XR um, creation tools. Um, so X XR is the, the terminology that, that describes these kind of technologies, VR, 
uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, this XR pipe, pipeline or umbrella, if you like, is kind of trying trying to define these technologies. And um, some of the create, creative tools we can use uh, are, are growing and growing. So for creatives um, who are looking to actually make immersive work themselves, we've got things like Tilt Brush, which is probably the easiest one out of the lot to use. It's really intuitive. You can actually paint in a 3D environment using a VR headset and create some fantastic work like this really um, pretty um, butterfly nebula that's um, actually made by a friend of mine um, who will come on to in a moment. And these are just really interesting ways you can actually rapidly prototype work and experience um, creating VR yourself. Um, so if you've got access to VR, I would really try and try some of those out. Um, some are quite uh, cheap, so blocks is free. Uh, tilt brush is about £20, £25. And the list is growing, of course. Um, I wouldn't um, be doing service to this this immersive technology if I didn't mention um, artists um, who are operating in this field and becoming, um, I would say, a next generation of, of artists that are making money and, and doing very well for themselves. So um, two, two examples here, uh, VR Rosie, um, who, who did the Butterfly Nebula in the previous example, um, she's doing some really interesting stuff in VR. She's done commissions for the BBC and um, she's draw drawing all sorts of crazy stuff uh, for the Football Museum in Manchester. And uh, she's just a really interesting person to, to check out. And then likewise, another, another person that I'm connected with uh, called Metageist. Um, he's actually selling pieces of artwork in what we could determine to be a metaverse being a virtual world where we can actually go and trade virtual artifacts online. Um, so the, the example there is that he sold 275 VR sculptures um, and the, the approximate price was $60 each. And I think if my maths is correct, that's approximately $16,500 that he made um, within um, a breakneck uh, I think it was about 30 minutes he made, he sold all those items. So he's, he's pretty much made sixteen and a half thousand dollars in first in 30 minutes. He's, he's obviously made those pieces of work over a number of days, but it just shows you the, the uh, power of this, this technology, um, and where this kind of metaverse is starting to emerge. Um, I just think I should mention as well, some of the, the design approaches to immersive technology. Um, this is a really interesting book by Jake Knapp, uh, former Google employee. Um, he created this sprint methodology. Um, I think in a lot of the VR labs that I've been involved with, we've kind of tried to use this um, sprint methodology to rapidly prototype VR works. It's a really interesting creative process. And then we've got the humble game design document where you kind of outline um, what the experience that you want to make is. And this is game theory really, but they're just two tools that you can actually use if you want to design VR experiences or immersive experiences. Moving on to the um, case studies, I'm just gonna show you some of the examples of the, the technologies um, and the things that uh, the company I run have been doing. Um, so some of the projects, um, going back to the uh, original slide, uh, included um, training simulators, uh, uh, virtual reality experience for fashion brands, heritage projects, uh, theatre and performing arts in 360. So this is um, trying to train employees on, on soft skills. So actually creating a VR simulation, which has been rolled out to the company now. Um, and it's actually being used and that's um, to deal with difficult customers. So these are the kind of soft skills that we might want to use the technology for. And the reason why I might want to use this technology is because it's it, the science backs up the use case of, of it. So it's um, speeding up um, the training time by reducing the costs of um, going to a physical location. It's so, because it's such a visual immersive media we retain more information because we're actually immersed in the environment and we can actually use metrics to, to measure um, the, the engagement with this technology as well. And we can also start thinking about empathizing with the customer situation. So when you're dealing with an angry customer, 
um, you're you're face to face with that, that situation. So it's like you're actually there in that situation. So in this particular um, example, what we did is um, we created multiple choices in the VR experience. So you could actually choose what you what you wanted to select, and based upon your answers to um, the, the the questions that you were asked or the responses to the customer rather the customer either got more angry or they calmed down and the idea there was that you were trying to bring the uh, conflict to a, a good conclusion and resolve their customer problem or customer complaint so i think there's a lot of scope for that kind of stuff and i think walmart are doing loads of stuff with this kind of kind of technology in america they've been out rolling their own customer training program but they've done it on a absolutely i don't know the actual figures off the top of my head but they've done it on an absolutely huge scale i mean they are walmart after all um so yeah it's an interesting one to look at i've uh, been working with the the nhs as well um on a project um not too dissimilar to the example i just shown a moment ago but this is um working with uh, lead clinici clinicians uh, senior gps and creating the, the scenarios with subject matter experts. So we're using the, the hard science around um, antimicrobial resistance training in this example. So for those that don't know that terminology, what that actually means is that um, when you see a GP, um, if you have a, a, a complaint of, of some sort of ailments like um, a sore throat, or um, if, you, if you think that you don't feel well, then you might ask for antibiotics. Now, obviously, um, one part of the problem with antibiotics administrating them to to everyone is that they they become resistant um um to actually um we actually have to change them each year i believe roughly so the idea here is to create a simulation based upon certain scenarios where you're acting as a doctor in this in this um simulated environment and then your choices are based on um what the clinicians have programmed in working with us to actually deliver this this accurate training material and that's trying to drive um, training and again allow um, the next generation of gps to experience what it's like to actually be on the front line deal with tricky patients i would say and really if you think about it that's kind of um it's changing that dynamic between the the gp and, and the patient it's almost becoming a customer-led scenario now we, 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 you know we're treating arguably um, patients are a little bit more like customers but that's kind of where we're going with this technology um, and that's the, the example um, that we we've, we've used to create uh, for the colleagues at um, Manchester Met um, some people might be familiar with the artist Joe Duffy um, he's from the School of Art um, I was fortunate to work with Joe um, I think about a year ago now, um, looking at um, his project, uh, Cleaning, which was essentially looking at Irish burial sites. Um, and it was, a, it was a really interesting project because what what was um, interesting was was our approach to the, the media that we were creating. So we, we were using drones and virtual reality, and that's kind of where, where I was brought in the VR stuff to create an immersive experience where you can actually physically go and visit the, these places. If you are interested in Irish burial, grites, uh, burial sites or uh, interested in the history of that, I'll put a link in the slide there as well. So check that out. But essentially that was... Um, looking at this idea of unconsecrated burials in Ireland and um, this this folklore, um, to quote Joe, it's an eerie encounter between worlds, the contemporary and the ancient, the world of the living and the world of limbo, of fairy lore and tragedy in a landscape embedded, embedded with sorrow. And uh, we were very privileged and fortunate to go around these places. And uh, it's, it was just crazy because we were going places that I don't think necessarily we're on any sort of um, archaeological record and they're just really interesting places so these these were uh, you kind of get these concentric circles that have been left uh, you can see the image on the bottom left there and the reason why they've been left is because farmers uh, wouldn't actually just dis disturb the ground because uh, they often were, were frightened of the repercussions of of fairies literally and this was built into the irish folklore for uh, you know sort of 
pre-Celtic um, traditions. So we're, we're talking, it's going way back, this kind of stuff, but it's definitely layers of different histories and different stories on top of that. Um, but it's, what's interesting is that these places still exist. And I think what's interesting about this technology is that we can actually physically go to these spaces and, and, and explore them. And actually looking at the the drone technology and exploring and mapping out these kind of spaces was was really interesting as well. Um, so if you are interested in reading more about that, then uh, check the link out um, in the slide there. Some of the um, other experiences that um, the company has been creating is working with uh, performing arts organizations. Um, this was the Mill Girls and Militants, which was actually a celebration of um, the suffrage movement as hundred years um, celebration of that movement. So it's quite a complex piece, uh, very detailed a piece of choreography. Um, and I worked with Ludus to create this uh, 360 immersive experience. And we was looking at really sort of the historical um, pioneers and in, um, in, in this um, suffrage movement and people who were um, prominent figures um, who actually paved the way for women's rights. So that was really interesting experience. I put a link on to the actual um, VR experience um, as, as well on there. And um, if people want to reach out to me, I'm happy to provide that as a, as a downloadable as well, if you're interested. And then lately, um, we've been working with theatre companies during the pandemic. Um, the example showing at the top is working for a company associated with Lowry and creating a VR experience for them. Can't really say much more about that at the moment, but um, the other one is a, another company um, creating this walkthrough experience where you can actually um, connect um, to the actual physical space. So what we're actually using there is 360 camera technology. Um, but again, being able to take the audience to these spaces and it's really interesting to think about, especially during a pandemic, because we can't actually go to theatre, of course. That's one of the things that has really been hit hard with um, COVID, I think, actually social spaces, you know, it could be the pub to some people, it could be the theatre to, to, to other people. And one of the other really interesting, I think, kind of groundbreaking, I would say, experiences uh, was the Degree Show on Mars. So, um, I was approached by Liverpool John Moores University to create this virtual exhibition, essentially. So because of the pandemic, it was to um, allow them to still have a degree show because um, quite often with art schools, they have an annual degree show for uh, fine arts or dance or film. This particular one was for fine art. So the way in which this was created was um, merging 3D scans of that space with um, 3D models and, and uploading that onto a website. So there's, there's a link there if you want to check that out as well, uh, degreeshowmars.com. And that that basically takes you to a Martian environment and you can actually explore the 3D shapes that the students have chosen. And then from there, you actually are beamed into Liverpool John Moores University and you can actually explore the degree show. So it's a way of um, circumventing the the pandemic and the COVID restrictions are still allowing um, people to actually go and visit that space. Um, that was um, showcased by, I get the name right, Hans Ulrich Albrist, I think his name is, from, is it a Sat Satchi, a Serpentine Gallery in London? So he came along and did, did a live um, Instagram feed and um, where he actually took people, you know, like a curator or sort of thing to the degree show. So that was a really interesting project to work on. Um, again, 360 stuff, working with the Wildlife Trust to create um, an immersive experience. This is kind of uh, the main goal of this uh, was to create this experience and be taken around dementia cafes to allow people um, to, to escape really and, and explore nature. It's a poetic piece, I guess this is, um, the the artistic roots that I've got um, actually being able to bring someone's vision to life. So working with uh, the Wildlife Trust and the carbon landscape in particular um, was really interesting um, to take uh, create this experience whereby you can actually explore what I deem to be carbon carbon landscape. So these are areas um, over the northwest um, 
that um, are former former mines, former pits, these dirty areas that are polluted that have been regenerated, re-greened, if you like. Um, so we're actually trying to encourage people to go and visit these environments. And the way in which we've done that is creates a virtual reality experience. So that's seen some success during this pandemic. That's actually a downloadable um, piece of material as well. I'm happy to uh, provide some links to, to that as well if you want to try that out. And my own practice, so um, when I was uh, studying filmmaking way back and actually exploring what I found interesting, I was really interested in um, sort of approaching things from a philosophical point of view, exploring um, spaces. And uh, I was kind of became a little bit obsessed with Edmund Burke at the time. And I made some short films and this kind of stuff around sort of landscape that elicits this, this idea of what we can deem to be called the sublime. So this is really sort of um, evoking these, these emotions of awe and terror at the same time. And there's, there's quite a broad definition of what the sublime is, but it's this idea that it's, uh, we can actually physically go to a, a space and actually um, uh, be feeling these emotions. And it's kind of got its roots in the, the romantic uh, romanticism era or the movement romanticism era movement. And that's kind of like um, you got William Blake, uh, people like this, um, what's his name now, Tennyson and um, Byron, Lord Byron, these kind of poets that are really sort of trying to explore the, these ideas of the, the romantic. So I was really interested in kind of um, exploring these, these sort of spaces in virtual reality. And that's kind of what I'm still trying to do today, really. Um, because I just find it really interesting. I think this is where the the technology could be um, interesting for people to actually go out into nature and explore other, other spaces and feel a little bit of of the sublime or feel a little bit of terror and actually be be safe as well. Um, so I've just put a few images there. Um, what I'm actually uh, thinking about, and then uh, my own sort of research approach is to actually physically go out and, and 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 make things so this is what i i tend to do so the the image here you're seeing is um game engine so i've created um something in unity and it's just taking this um the these backgrounds that are filmed and creating these um experiences um like kind of start off in space and and this kind of thing and basically what's happening is that um you're able to explore like the, the north of Scotland. I think I'm just going to reset my timer. Um, so yeah, the idea is that, that you go into Orkney and these kind of places um, and using VR. So this is a lot of 360 video capture. Um, but what I've done here is I've made this experience in interactable, um, pretty much using simple interactions. I've not got the sound on this slide because I don't want to kill the presentation again. But um, yeah, this is Maze How, uh, which is on the tip of Orkney, uh, which is on the northeast of Scotland, I think, or the very tip of Scotland, off, off the coast. Um, so yeah, the, the idea here is that um, to play really and, and try and create, and um, I'm always sort of shooting stuff with a 360 camera um, or a drone, trying to actually capture something and, and play around and see what's possible, uh, which can lead into the next slides, um, what I'm working on at the moment, really. So I'm going to give you a little bit more of an insight of, of um, what, what I'm working on at the minute, which is uh, 3D mapping. So I'm actually using drone technology at the moment to capture environments. So off the back of the Kalini project, really, working with Joe Duffy, it kind of gave me an idea to actually physically go and, and scan these spaces. Um, I'm really interested in the, the potential for LiDAR to, to enable us to do this, to create immersive uh, media and, and to actually physically go and visit spaces because I think there's a real opportunity there, especially with this kind of space archaeology and this kind of stuff going on at the moment, whereby satellites are literally taking photographs of, of the Earth, is my understanding of it, and actually we're able to see layers of history underneath that we never never knew was actually um, there before. And it's kind of helping us to rewrite um, human history and re-understand human history, rather. Um, so what I'm trying to do at the moment is, um, is experiment around um, using um, photogrammetry from the sky, pretty much, and create these 3D environments. So this is just... Um, 
but Lake District, um, just you know, flying around and experiments and stuff. And this is kind of the output I want to achieve on on the left. Um, so I've just been shooting some stuff. That this this one on the left isn't mine. This is a, um, this is actually a megalithic temple in Malta, I believe, which is supposed to be. Um, like a real hub in Europe of, of crazy uh, megalithic structures. I think that's kind of really interesting um, to look at the these sites with this immersive ta- uh, technology and, and capture these spaces and allow people to actually physically go to these spaces. And I think there's a real um, interesting growth industry in this kind of stuff that's not been properly tapped yet because um, there's such a wealth of uh, history in this country and particularly in Europe and Ireland and these kind of places as well. I'm going to touch on a little bit of where I think the, the industry is going. Um, there's a little bit of gimmicky kind of activity going on at the moment with these kind of aug- augmented reality filters. Um, I've been playing around a little bit. I'm working with an artist at the moment to create some work. Um, using filters, but um, is, I guess the most uh, popular example that everyone quotes, which is Pokemon Go, which was the uh, pretty much a treasure hunt game where you, you actually go and find the Pikachu, wherever he was. Um, but I, mean, I think, think some people ended up walking into roads and stuff like that, so don't do that, obviously. Um, but this kind of, the idea of using these Snapchat filters, um, AR Spark, and these kind of um, technologies to augment your appearance is slowly allowing um, the industry to actually get a foothold. I don't know who that person is in the slide, by the way. Looks familiar. Uh, but it's uh, it's an interesting way of actually just quickly changing over an image and um, sharing that with the world. But um, I think there's, there's a lot more possibility with this technology around the corner. And when, when we start thinking about um, these other technologies that are occurring at the same time, the way in which we consume media. So we've got, uh, for example, Bandersnatch, um, who actually was sued, actually, recently, I found out, um, because they breached, um, I think, the game manufacturer they quoted in in the Bandersnatch experience, which is available on Netflix, by the way. Um, they, they didn't have permission to use them, so they've, they've actually give them, had to give them a payout. Um, but that's a really interesting example to try out, Bandersnatch, if you're not already. So if you've got a tablet or if you've got a mobile phone um, or a smart device, I think smart TV, you can use it on now as well. It's basically a choose-your-own-adventure. Um, so you go on there and you determine where the protagonist goes. The the twist, without spoiling it too much there, is that it's based on theory that um, there is no freedom of choice, really. So it's the illusion of choice. So we start looking into... Um, I can't remember what the, the philosophical terminology is, but it's kind of this idea that um, it's determinism or something like that, I think it is maybe, where we've not actually got free will and choice, where things are actually preordained already, and this is kind of what you're playing as the role of controlling this protagonist, which is really interesting. And then um, what we've had recently is Jude Law starring in, in Punch Drunk, uh, Punch Drunk's um, interactive um, show where the the audience could actually um, it's called the eighth day I think it was called where the audience could actually participate in real real time with with the cast as well. Um, I was reading the abstract about that um, which was published as well. So the idea was that the the audience could actually uh, influence the storyline. I don't know how well that's been done. I, I did tune into a couple of episodes. It was a little bit strange, but it's certainly interesting to start thinking about the way in which we we consume media audience participation i think is definitely a thing that's going to increase um, and that's going to give companies and, and organizations a real edge in a time of, of media saturation which is actually probably being driven by netflix themselves because i mean it's just binge watching isn't it um these the promised land of smart glasses so we keep hearing about these augmented reality or mixed reality, whichever way you want to want to uh, frame it. These glasses that are going to be that the godsend of marketing, and they're going to allow us to walk around these worlds. And using the example before that, I couldn't get the sound playing at first. You know, the one with the filters around the world. So the idea with with that short film example is that basically you're going to be wearing one of these headset um, devices. So it's actually augmented reality glasses. So. Um, on the right there, and we've got the image that was Google Glass, which didn't kind of work out. They kind of tried to get all these celebrities like Tom Hanks and people wearing these glasses. And uh, for whatever reason, it, they didn't have the business case there, didn't, didn't actually work out. 
And then we have um, the mixed reality ones from Magic Leap, and they were another company that came along, and they were, again, giving us the promised land of augmented reality. Everyone would be using it, blah, blah, blah. But it's actually mixed reality, to be fair. I did I did experience some mixed reality at, at home in Manchester using the Magic Leap, actually, where I thought it was kind of interesting. But it's that again, it's that gimmicky factor. And they, they were telling us they were going to um, roll this out and it's going to be amazing. And then I think they went bust in the end again, another example of where this technology uh, is supposed to be delivered, this 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 promised land, uh, it hasn't materialized. And then I was reading a, an article, excuse me, in The Guardian the other day. And The Guardian was, was again, postulating this idea of Apple smart um, devices that you're able to put on your, your head and actually traverse... Um, this new digital world. I think it is coming, but how how much do people want to stick um, augmented reality glasses on yet? Probably in the next generation. Um, and then it's t- kind of tying into this idea of, um, and I wanted to frame this for this particular audience that I'm speaking to today, because I think it's kind of interesting to start thinking about these ideas of, of this singularity event and not necessarily the terminology singularity but if you think about the emerging technology that's taking place now you've got augmented reality virtual reality you've got nanotechnology um you've got genetics changing robotics ai all these kind of stuff that are going on you've got uh, the space industry seemingly growing and they're all promising this kind of new new world we're going to be stepping into and if you are interested in looking at the futurists that um are thinking about this kind of stuff then my own personal um look into that is kind of people like Ray Kurzweil. Um, he was hired by Google um, as a director of engineering focusing, focusing on machine learning. And if you read his book, The Singularity is Near When Humans Transcend Biology, which is a pretty big book. I and mean, it probably took me a couple of years to read it, to be honest with you. Uh, but he's kind of um, putting forward this idea that man's going to become cy- uh, cybernetic is going to become a cyborg and merge with technology. You could argue that, you know, with the with the mobile phone today, we've, we're only one step away from that. What's the difference between having it in your hand and a, and a chip in your head? Well, the ability to remove it. But we're kind of we're going in that direction. Um, and the the Guardian article that I made reference to the other day, um, that was interesting because it was trying to put forward the idea of this this cyborg human that we would have these glasses and we're already using these wireless earbuds and this kind of stuff and we're becoming more and more machine-like which you could argue is the reason why we're becoming more and more overloaded because we're on that crusp of um, actually stepping over the threshold and if people like Elon Musk have the way the neuro, neural link um, becomes a reality but it, again it could be it could be fantasy it's a lot of this stuff I think as well and I was reading an article um, put forward by Werner Herzog, who's um, an intellectual filmmaker and cult- I guess a little bit of a cultural theorist. And he was kind of shooting down the idea of Musk being able to take us to the stars, and he was setting out his ideas why. So it's interesting to to, to um, start thinking about the these technologies, where where they're taking us, and and really where the promised land is of this technology, because for all their greatness, um, we've not been able to deal with covid seemingly in, in in the western world at least we're not been able to deal with it i would say very well i mean that's a different kettle of fish obviously but um where is the technology taking us you know and um, some of the other things the the technology the immersive technology has allowed us to do is to go to these virtual events so um i went to this gig um if you like or festival called lost horizon that was really interesting so you could don a vr um, headset and you can actually physically walk around the space you could design your own avatar and that was really interesting to to try um, and actually do that and that was like at the height of the pandemic where we were completely locked down in the first wave that was really interesting but you've got um, artists like Travis Scott who were who were performing in in games engines uh, using um, Fortnite which is an actual game and he had over 12 million people 12 million gamers worldwide watch his performance and that's that's the kind of idea of this metaverse stepping forward where we're actually stepping into this digital space and we're actually able to watch gigs and socially interact with each other and i think that's really interesting as a as a potential for growth as well 
the other examples in this include the, the virtual factory, um, the, the image on the left, which is what MIF, Manchester, Inter Manchester, Inter yeah, Manchester International Festival, have been involved with recently. And then we've got the Burning Man VR Festival, which is kind of this glowing neon female figure below that. And then um, we've got also... And lost, um, sorry, Facebook Horizons, which is um, something that that's in beta at the moment. So you can actually physically make your own worlds without actually needing any any coding knowledge, any games engine knowledge. You can actually make these worlds and publish them online on Facebook and share them with your community, and people can actually step into your spaces. And I think that's where this 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 technology lies. Really, it's a bit um, facilitating people to be able to create without a lot of this complicated coding. You'll always have a, a need for that, but I think actually being able to allow people to step over the barrier of technology it is the, the strength of it, really, and I think that's why it is here to stay. Uh, some of the tools, just just um, I think I should mention for augmented reality creation, just off the back of the 360 production. Um, so you can download... Um, software on your home computer and play around with pretty easily there's loads of tutorials online uh, for snap studio um, ar spark and even um, project aero which you do need an adobe account for that allows you to create more i guess bespoke augmented reality experiences and that allows you to really start playing in with the idea of placemaker augmented reality so for example when you physically go to maybe a statue um you would bring your phone up you would scan that statue and the statue would physically start talking to you and that's kind of the idea of, of, of place making so it's a physical interaction with real world objects and um, to elicit or actually create these experiences where an audience can actually physically go and visit them so these are the these are the uh, some of the technologies you can actually use i'm just touching on uh i've kind of done this already but um I think uh, it's really interesting to start thinking about um, space technology in your hands. Um, so Apple giving you access to LiDAR technology on the iPhone 12 Pro is, is pretty amazing, really. I mean, Apple have been, been doing some great and groundbreaking stuff for a number of years now. I mean, the way um, Steve Jobs um, delivered the um, the iPad and revolutionized the way we we consume music was, was really interesting. But now we're kind of kind of getting these really advanced cameras in our own pockets and that, that's that's crazy to think about you've actually got a device that's capable of scanning using lidar technology um and lidar is um as the description there but that's allowing you to get really advanced scans of the environment and like the example i was showing you before where you can actually scan um from an aerial point of view and create these 3d models i think that's really interesting Thinking about, oh, I can't show that video. Something's happened to that video. But uh, thinking about, um, I was touching on before, these new techniques for filmmakers. Um, these are virtual production. So you're starting to see these studios pop up more and more now. And these are, excuse me, uh, it's virtu virtual production um, workflows, if you like. And these are essentially using games engine technology. I'll try and show an example of this because the video is not loaded for some reason. But um, essentially, uh, we've got big studios in America adopting this te technology, but it's also enabling smaller studios to, to actually create um, film films using Games Engine. So using, in this example, uh, Unreal, and you actually create um, a 3D, uh, sorry, a green screen space, and you actually use the Game Engine to create any background you want. And literally, you can... And the, the background here in the example is of the Mandalorian, which is the Star Wars franchise. Um, the video is not working, but I'll try and find out um, and, and dig out the link for you. It's obviously made it more private. But um, that's allowing filmmakers to create real-world environments from the comfort of their own studio or home without actually physically needing to go to these spaces and spend thousands of dollars of transport and a crew, um, transport in the people who've got to feed the crew. Uh, you know, you're talking about all the actors and this kind of stuff. So straight away, 
um, you, you're saving potentially million dollars, millions of dollars on a, on a big shoot. And also, uh, if you think about things like the pandemic, it's allowing um, the creative industry around filmmaking to carry on producing work. And we've seen a real explosion of these techniques that are happening now. Um, if you have a look, um, uh, Unreal, Google Unreal virtual production, you'll see a plethora of um, articles, links, and um, guides and tutorials on how to do that. I was going to show you this video, but for some reason it's they've made it private. So I'll try and take that out towards the end. Oh, there we go. It's popped up now. Um, but I'm not going to play the sound because I had issues with that before. Uh, but, but essentially what they're doing is... Um, they're, they're using the studio environment. Obviously, they've got, I mean, they've got millions of dollars, haven't they? Um, but check this link out. I'll put a link to this in the chat as well. Um, so you see here in this example what they're actually doing. Find you a good segment. So they've got this backdrop, and that's actually a green screen, and it's projected using Unreal Engine. So what they're doing in the game engine, they're connecting it to the green screen, and they're creating any any virtual background they want to. And then they put a camera in that space, a physical real camera, and they actually film it. Can you see an example where they're actually tilting it in real time? So that, because it's photo real as well, they're pretty much able to create any, any environment they want to create. And they don't have to go and physically uh, visit a space. Uh, so it's really really interesting way of this technology is now breaking ground in, in the creative industries. And I've seen more and more companies adopting this technology. A lot of London-based companies are doing this kind of stuff. Well, that's where the money is. A lot of studios are doing this stuff now as well. I think there's a big um, screen school opening in um, Liverpool come in as well. And uh, there's another one in Pine, Pine, what is it? Pinewood Studios. They're, they're adopting this technology, I believe, as well. So that's really interesting. Um, some of the other techniques include volumetric um, capturing. So this is the idea of you actually capturing um, your subjects using hologram hologram capture techniques so a project that i worked on a few years ago uh, for st george's hall in liverpool and we actually filmed our actors using green screen similar to the example I just showing you then and we actually captured their uh, light mass and then we took that light mass data so it's basically data zeros and ones and we take that into a game engine and we create these holograms and you can see, you kind of get a, a visual feel for this type of um, trope that's been used for a number of years now. It's a few years old, this technology. But the example I showed you with the um, LiDAR iPhone is really taking that step forward. And I can see that the, the iPhone taking over from this a little bit complicated technology, really. But it allows us to start... Um, creating holograms and taking those holograms and putting them into augmented reality experiences, virtual reality experiences. And recently, um, I believe that Kanye West's wife, what's her name now? Um, Mrs. Kanye West, I forget her name, Kim Kardashian West. Uh, she recently got a present from her husband and it was uh, the effigy of a dead father talking to her as a hologram, which is uh, it just it came out just before Halloween, funnily enough as well. And it, it's like very Black Mirror, uh, but they, they thought that was fantastic. So someone created a hologram of um, Kim Kardashian West's dead father and give her that as a, as a present, as like a giant uh, talking effigy and uh yeah it's, it's really weird but that's the kind of stuff we can do with this technology so look into that by the way as well I'll, again i'll try and find a link for you um very interesting stuff if you're interested in the kind of um dynamics of the sector where, where it's growing um there's a link there to the immersive economy report i don't think the uh, latest one's out i think this is 20, 2019 on that link and that kind of uh, gives you a sector by sector analysis of the immersive technology industry, looking at things like construction, education, training, and all sorts of uh, uh, industry segments. Um, my own sort of research has also um, led me down the path of um, looking at sort of game theory as well. Uh, this this person's really interesting, Jane McGonigal. Um, she's kind of a, a futurist. Really interestingly, um, in this book, Reality is Broken, and this is published in early 2000, uh, I think about 2004, 2008. I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, she's talking about the coming pandemics in, in the future. So the, the, these future, futurists were already seeing this uh, based on trends that we're already having these these pandemics that we just can't, um, weren't materialized in the Western world yet. 
So um, it's really interesting to start thinking about a gamified approach to solving problems. I'm not saying this is the answer, but it's, it's what she's trying to put forward in this book is like we can actually work together and create these these experiences, social experiences to to actually solve real world problems. So I think that's a really interesting um, way of thinking about the world. And she did a TED talk called Gaming Can Make a Better World as well, um, which is available online. Um, check that out if you're really interested in people who are really on on the on the money and thinking about the future i think uh, she's really interested in the, the book if you're really interested and it's called reality is broken and that's like i say a gamified approach to solving real world problems it's uh, excellent i think i'm coming towards the end now Johannes. um i've taught for a long time um i'm about 12 um 15 almost so um I'll just bring in some of the links as well to, to other stuff as well. Um, some of the articles, uh, some of the, the immersive groups in Manchester as well. Um, part of uh, future artists meetup group as well. This is kind of where we was based in the shed um, actually at uh, Manchester Met for a number of years. Uh, I believe the shed's gone now and we live in this, this new world, whatever that world is where we can't physically meet and uh, we'll see what happens in the future. Um, we've also got a Facebook group if you're interested in joining that. Um, and also VR Manchester as well. It's a really interesting group. Again, not currently meeting up because of the pandemic. Um, and just, just want to close on um, really just, just some points of stimulation in regards to uh, the current situation we're in now. Maybe um, maybe we start thinking about all these technologies, how they can how we've not been able to do the things we've, we've been able to do and how, how these kind of immersive technologies, again, it's under quite a broad umbrella, but I've touched on some examples for you today, um, how we can actually navigate this world and, and this current lockdown situation. And um, we can start thinking about what, what we love doing, what we can't do and are there technologies that can enable us to, to actually do this. And that's why we're seeing a proliferation of the use of zoom and um, these other technologies really. So I think, um, on that, I mean, I can leave my contact details there, but I think it's probably best to like, lay on this slide, so to speak. Johannes. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, now, okay, so we are going for the questions in the chat. Uh, so it, just let me scroll back okay. to the beginning of that. <laughs> I think we have uh, the first question, if I'm not wrong, was from Costas. So Costas is saying, we are using Matterport to 3D scan cultural spaces, for example, museum exhibitions. And we'd like to know, uh, to, to now export those 3D scans in Unity UE so that we can manipulate those spaces, add 3D scanned objects and multimedia content and create a social and immersive experience in those 3D scan spaces for people through avatars. Matterport is easy and quick, but the way we want to use it seems not easily uh, compatible with it. Would, uh, and here comes the question, would you recommend a different approach to create those mixed reality and socially interactive spaces? Yes, um, I have got first hand experience with exactly that just to give a bit of context to everyone else who heard that question. It's a very technical question. And that relates to a piece of technology. It's called a Matterport scanner. Um, it's a camera that you use and using I've showed the degree show Mars example before we use the Matterport camera to scan our spaces. And then we connected that to a custom web server to allow this uh, interactive immersive experience. But essentially, what the Matterport is doing is scanning a space and allow you to, to export a free 60 environment that can be hosted on Matterport's environment to answer the question um it's 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 a terrible thing that Matterport give you because they they give you an opportunity to download a mesh and export that mesh into a game engine um during the uh, the construction of the degree show on Mars uh, we decided not to go down that avenue because uh, we found it very difficult to translate um the actual mesh um which is like a 3d model into a game engine i would start looking at other things like like the iphone 12 personally um they've uh, matterport are also doing support for android at the moment i would seriously think about using 
um, just a 360 camera in, in that case because it's really heavy mesh they're giving you Matterport, although it should work in a game engine. It, it doesn't integrate very well, in my opinion, and what I've used before. I hope that answers the question. So Costas, if you have any follow-up questions on that, please enter it into the chat. And anyone else, please just enter your questions into the chat field and I will read them to Keith. Uh, we, have a, we have a comment earlier on uh, from Emily Webb uh, uh, saying, oh, I'm originally from Ireland. We ha have one of those at our bedside at our house. So. Oh, well, there you go, oh. yeah. I'm not surprised they're everywhere. <laughs> I wonder where she where's she from? Maybe she can tell us where she's from in Ireland in the in the chat as well, if she doesn't mind. Um it was over the, the west of Ireland we, we were in. Um and also Graham Holland uh sent uh, the Mandalorian video. Oh great, thanks. Everyone with a link. Um and Millie Woodrow Hill asks, uh, do you have any good examples of how this technology has been used in health research? Yes, um, there's there's um, there's a lot of data. I don't have it to hand right now, um, but if you if you want to um, drop me an email, I can actually uh, hook you up. There's a lot of um, papers that have been written. There's a lot of scientific data. I've read. Um, quite a few journals now uh, but i'd have to dig, dig those out i don't have those to hand um on the the um the application and use of immersive technology for um medical purposes i'm actually speaking on a panel um a medical led panel um next month i need to publish the details of that but um i've been invited to um, speak on that panel around the immersive work that i've done in uh, for the nhs so that, that could be quite interesting um if you want to reach out with, to me on LinkedIn or um, one of the other channels on that that uh, link, I'm happy to provide more information. Fantastic, Keith. Just you have your email in the PowerPoint presentation, don't you? Yeah, correct. It's on, on uh, the link. There. So, and you will share the PowerPoint presentation with us. Yes. So that's how you would get in touch with Keith afterwards through uh, that email. Uh, okay. So, uh, Kate, to everyone, thank you so much for this. I've learned loads. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> she has to go to another meeting. <laughs> um, uh, right. Okay. So, Emily Webb says the fairy ring is called uh, the Rough Fort. Uh, uh, I know it. On the North Coast. Uh, so, Martin Turner asked everyone, what recommended setup for uh, uh, novice people for 360-degree uh, video creation, uh, for example, for Manchester lab technicians, etc.? Not necessarily the best quality, but easy to set up. Did you e get that? Easy, easy one, that one. Um, I can point him back to just going back in the presentation for him um, is... Um, Basically, if he's interested, try these cameras here, Samsung Gear and Samsung Gear 2. They're really cheap. You pick them up next to nothing secondhand. And that's a really uh, basic entry-level way of um, getting into the technology. That's why I included it. So um, get those cameras. You can pick them up for a Samsung Gear 1 for less than 100 quid secondhand. Easy. Fantastic. And Martin, if you have any follow-up questions, just please yeah, feel free to ask those. Uh, and Millie says, thank you. That would be great. I'll drop you a line. And uh, uh, Johnny thought it was a brilliant presentation. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, now, uh, OK. So Omer asks, any advice on how we can import CSV text files in Unity and create a mesh with textures? Thanks. Hmm, I don't know the answer to that question, if I'm honest with you. Um, yeah, and I would imagine there's, um, I've come across that before somewhere else. Um, my first instinct is to go to Google, you know, as we do, but um, it's, um, you probably can do it, but um, 
it's it's going to be very very tricky to do it there'll probably be if you look on github there probably is a repository probably someone's created um a method for that um finding useful help on unity can be uh, pretty difficult sometimes or or even unreal that's that's part of the problem with this this stuff as well finding really good help help stuff but i would have a look on the unity forums um for that and um, see if you can find the information there really i don't know off the top of my head uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, okay, so Steve asked, do you see community developed uh, content extended from the game engine modding community on the horizon? 100%. Um, I've been involved with um, games designers and developers over this pandemic. There's um, a really, um, a really interesting self-startup group, Leeds-based, to I'm doing this thing called free, free P VR. Um, it's um, F R E E P VR, and that's like a it's an online platform that um, a small company set up where you can actually visit in in VR, and it's like they, they host these um, these events and these uh, music events as well, and that's just an independent company that's doing that. So it's definitely there's definitely growing scope, and there's communities popping up all all over the place. Uh, the metaverse hasn't been created yet, but it's under construction. Um, we've got to be careful that um, the big corporations don't end up owning it all, like Facebook Horizons. But that that kind of is where we're going at the moment, I think. Thank you, Keith. Uh, uh, Rosella, hello there, Rosella. Long time no see. Uh, I'm happy that you got in touch with us. I guess you're in Portugal now, uh, or maybe in the United States even. Uh, Rosella writes, thanks a lot. Do you know if there are experiences to make or see with children? Some years ago, there was a legal disclaimer saying that VR vision is not suitable for people under 13 years old. That's a good, very good point. I would stick with that parameter, by the way, because um, what happens is um, when I did an exhibition a few years ago, there was a guy who came to view a piece of my work and he was like, uh, he had his kid, and his kid was about five. And he was like, um, oh, let my, let my child see the VR. And I was like, I think he's too young to do it. And he was very, very insistent. I said, like, like, you know, I don't really think you should do that. And he he did it. And he had a kid put on the VR. And like the kid's like, oh, I started freaking out. And I was just like, yeah, because <laughs> um, the brain, the brain isn't formed uh, enough around that age group. So it's around 12 or 13 now, depending on which country you're in. And um, I would stick to that parameter. I don't think, um, although my nephew, he when he was 10, 11, he was using VR and he was fine. So it just depends on um, the person, really. It kind of, it's like, it's like um, don't walk on the grass, isn't it, you know? Um, it's it's a sign to to do something, but it's it's whatever works best. But I, I was I would stick around that age group personally. Thank you, Keith. Uh, well, just to uh, give a note, since Rosella is not here in in person, Rosella is working on a very interesting project with uh, a participatory um, um, virtual reality. Uh, with female uh, inmates in Italy that they they are in prison with with the children. Wow! Uh, so she, she's actually exploring how you can use virtual reality filmmaking uh, as part of that, which is uh, uh, fantastic. So I I hope to hear more from you in the future, Rosella. Uh, but just on that, Rosella, maybe try the Google Cardboard for the kids because it's not as not as closing the head head off. If that's an integral part of this, then maybe, excuse me, trying to use the Google Cardboard as a full, as as opposed to a full head-mounted display might be might help you out. Right, uh, Carlos Osario, uh, Osorio, sorry, uh, to answer Omar's question, you can extract the data from CSV, convert it into Vector Three through scripting. So that's very useful information uh, to Omar. Thank you for that, yeah. Um, and Omer just saw that, so, <laughs> and, and he asked a follow-up question, does Unity have a specific library code to do this or anywhere I can find more about this script? That might be something that you know yeah. about. It's, uh, it depends on the Unity version and 
the uh, native library is using. So there's so many different versions of the game engine. That's part of the challenge. Some Unity versions will work with some things and some Unity, Unity versions won't work, work with others. So just needs to have a look at that in more detail, I think. Brilliant. OK, so please sending us uh, questions on the chat if you have any. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, a couple of questions myself now to Keith. That I'm maybe to... maybe after that, Johannes, you can offer to open the mic if anyone wants to ask, ask a, a direct question as well, perhaps as well. That's up to Matt. The, the mic is actually a problem on <laughs> Zoom security. All oh, right. OK, no, no worries. That's we can stick with so this. We'll, we'll ask Matt about that. OK. Um, Right. So my question for you. So uh, during our courses uh, uh, at drama and film at the University of Manchester, uh, you uh, have been working as a guest lecturer there. Uh, and what we, what, what we actually been exploring more and more, which I find incredibly interesting coming from film studies myself, is how uh, it differently the, 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 the narrative is working when you're trying to make a, a VR film compared to the, the film formats we are used to. So uh, how, how would you describe the key points in how to build a VR film narrative compared to building just a film script? Very good question. The first thing you need to realize is that the medium is completely different. So the the idea of of, of let's use virtual reality as an example of, of an immersive technology. The thing is with virtual reality, you've got a headset, you're inside an experience. So if you physically move the camera around quite quickly when you're recording the virtual reality experience, if it's made using a 360 camera, then straight away when your participant puts the headset on, they're going to feel nauseous and sick. So you need to think about things like stage in the experience. You need to think about where you position the camera and predominantly maybe think about putting the camera on some sort of tripod or solid device. Then the next thing you need to think about is um, the, the key areas of interest around you. So we've got the curiosity zone that, that exists behind us. Not everyone goes for that, but normally your peripheral vision is kind of um, perpendicular around and you, you, this is your point of interest, the center kind of here, the two points here, and then we can look around. So the way in which you'd approach it is that you would need to consider everything that's in the frame. Whereas on a, on a traditional film set, you would be looking at a rectangular traditionally now 16 by 9 frame and that would be um what you would film and create so um, things like um shooting for drama for example work particularly well in traditional film because it allows us to cut quickly but in virtual reality though those cuts can be very jarring and they can disorient us because if you move to scene to scene very quickly what happens is your brain has to re reorientate itself in that environment and that takes probably a few milliseconds i don't know the exact time but um that's something that needs to take place so you have to reorientate yourself in that environment so you wouldn't um create an immersive piece immersive experience virtual reality in this case and um, whereby you've got lots of fast, fast cuts unless you're trying to make your audience feel nauseous or sick and that's the intention to give that feeling what you would do is generally use slower transitions you would use audio to transport your viewer into the next space gradual fades um, points where the user would look at would change slowly if you really go into the cgi stuff and, and the games engine technology then there's a lot of stuff you can do so you can fracture the environment and that could be a transition for example you just got to think about what your viewer is going to going to be seeing all around them and how they're going to move to the environment. So I think the examples that we worked on together, Johannes, um, some of the students were, were making some really interesting empathy pieces mm -hmm. um, and they were really considering what the medium can do in terms of being an em empathy machine. And that's one of its real strengths, really. It's allowing us to be in the shoes of somebody else. And I, I think that's really where its power is. So when we're approaching the creation of whatever you're creating, really what we should be doing is thinking about is immersive technology right for this? Because if it's not, then you shouldn't be creating it. And 90% of the stuff that exists is a gimmick, I would say. And there's probably 10% that's really good stuff. But I've given you what I think is the, is the best stuff in this presentation. I pointed you towards the, the, the strong stuff that's thinking about this medium that's allowing us to 
explore a different way of, of creating and interpreting work. Thank you, Keith. So Johnny has a question for you here. Where is a good starting point if an academic wants to create a virtual field trip? I guess something like Google to Creator? Yeah, um, Google did have a platform until very recently, actually, and they pulled the plug on it, and it was called Google Art, uh, Google Arts and Civilization, and that was um, a way you could actually uh, physically go and explore different exhi exhibits. If he's um, the, the the person asking the questions uh, was trying to create a virtual tour, well, in actual fact, what he can do is if he's got access to a VR headset, he can use Google Google Earth VR. And you can physically go and, and actually explore the world in a headset. That is actually an actual thing. So you can actually go to Google, use Google Earth VR and physically go to a, a space. And what you could potentially do with that is, is curate your own your, your own spaces. Um, a project I worked on for my grad film, actually, a few years ago, um, I made a, a tour of um, a fire station in London. London Road Fire Station, and that was like um, it's kind of a virtual tour where you could go and ex explore the space. But what made that interesting was the rich and interesting history of the the community that existed in, in that space. And what made it strong was uh, examining that community and finding those stories and embedding those stories in the experience. And I think I don't mean to um, sound like I'm, I'm using a pun, but it is it is storytelling really in a way because. And without a good story, then you're just creating a thing. But if you've got something that's got a good story in the experience, and that that's true with with a lot of art forms, really, and then you you're actually giving giving some somebody a, a strong experience. So I would think about maybe maybe the narrative of what it is you're trying to do, what type of tour it is, what makes it interesting. Um, using a 360 camera to capture. Um, like I showed in the example before, is a really interesting uh, way of, of actually going and physically filming and experimenting yourself. These cameras, like I say, are really cheap. Um, and then you can edit them. You can use uh, Premiere Pro, which obviously got paid for the package. But if you're an academic, you should have an academic license for that. And then uh, things, there's free tools as well, free video editing software tools as well. You can use uh, Blender is a free 3D creation package. You can edit 360 video in Blender. Although it's a bit chunky, the workflow, but there are other 360 editing tools available as well. Great. So uh, uh, Carlos is adding here um, to Omer, exactly like Keith said, depending on the version you're using, check out the documentation on the uh, procedural mesh creation to set up how to create your mesh. Uh, you can find this on Unity's user guide of your version, then find examples of CSV parsing to learn how to extract the data from your CSV. You can find this online and you have uh, to test it to see if it works on your version. Combine the two ideas. Okay. Uh, so um, Johnny send, says thank you, and also Otto says thank you. It thought it was great. Um, brilliant. Any more questions, please? Anyone? Anyone uh, wants to ask, ask on the mic, maybe? I, I, I have a question for you. Another thing I kind of, what I'm, one of the things I most appreciated in the course we had with with the second year students last year was how they started to uh, apply it. So uh, just what, what uh, possibilities do you see with regards to social applications of virtual reality? Uh, because obviously, um, uh, Traditionally, VR at Manchester has been quite dominated by science, but actually when you speak about social applications uh, uh, and VR, uh, what do you think about that? I think there's, um, there's an untapped um, ground for all this yet. And I think the reason why you're seeing companies like Facebook who bought Oculus invested in this because they rec recognize the social power of, of virtual reality. But Part of the problem with this technology, and it is worth noting at the moment, is the clunkiness of it. So it's great that we, we've got the ability to put a headset on and physically go go to another space. But part of the 
part of the thing is a lot of people don't want to have to do that because what we want, we want things that ease our transition. So the reason why TV screen works so well is because you just turn it on and it's, it works. We know it works and it's worked for a number of years. The thing is with, with the uh, VR is that it's got the, the great potential to allow us to enter spaces and, and physically meet up and this kind of stuff. But it is getting better. It's getting smaller and less expensive. I think if it's going to really grow, then they, they need, need to focus on these community spaces and allow uh, groups to come together to create their own experiences. We're seeing Facebook Horizon trying to do this thing now. And then we've seen a little bit of a shift away from their app production process. So they're opening it up in terms of being able to develop for the Oculus Quest device, which is encouraging, but they need to they need to help foster the 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 growth in that industry by by giving something back. I don't know what that is yet. I think um, if you look at um, things like Fortnite, then it's proven that it's a huge, not only a multi million dollar industry, but it's also a, a huge global point of connecting people there's people that meet up from all across the world playing Fortnite, and the metaverse is growing and growing and growing there's things like uh I think it's called Ro- robo looks now and these kind of other spaces which i didn't even know about and these are these are massive online communities they're just not in the the uh i would say the 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 news at the moment but they're actually growing communities so I think it's going to continue to grow, especially when in, in a time of pandemics. I mean, is this the first pandemics? We don't know. But if the futurists are right, then we're going to, you know, this won't be the first one, put it that way. Um, so we will see an increased growth in this technology. And I think what Apple are doing with the iPhone is taking that, shifting that technology, that 3D technology, it's going to merge with the, the headsets and AI and maybe you'll have a button in your house and they'll press something and some sort of holographic thing will go go on around you. You won't need to put a headset on. I think that's where we'll end eventually, probably 10, 20 years away yet. Great. Yeah, that's some science fiction for you. But, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, happening. it's happening, you know. It, it's, it's happening. Okay. How can we answer to the question using some quantity data that VR is a good replacement to a 2D screen monitor, or how does an additional step from monitor to VR help? It's a good question. Um, so that's have, that's Homer, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd have to look at the the academic evidence that 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 uh, backs this up. Uh, I follow a number of uh, online journals um, related to virtual reality, and I follow one that's. Um, related to science and, and, and innovation. Um, I'll have to, again, dig that out. I don't have that off, off, off the top of my head, but these are academic papers that are wrote around the, the use, the business, the, the um, scientific data around using this technology and um, how it can be applied and, and the case for actually using the technology as opposed to a 2D screen. So the ev- all I can say at the moment is the evidence is there if you do some research um, and it shows that immersive technology does speed up um, engagement, it do- does um, improve engagement, does speed up learning. And they've done, I was reading a journal last year, um, experiments done with PTSD patients and it's showing that it can alleviate a lot of these symptoms and problems for people to integrate back into society. I've read academic papers relating to um, people coming out of prison. Maybe the example of the lady uh, who asked before as well. There's an academic paper that I read last year that was relating to this take, took place in America of all places, um, the release of prisoners and they were using virtual reality to um, allow people to what's the word I'm looking for, become more used to being out in the real world before they they actually release the people into the real world after their parole period or probation period um, had ended. So there is a lot a lot of science around this. Um, there's a lot of academic writing around this as well. I'll um, if you want to drop me a message, I can I can point you in the direction of that, some of that stuff. I don't want to start searching on the internet now because of the the screen issues that I had before, but um, I've got those the, some of those links for for that person. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Any more questions, anyone? Please just add them to the chat field. 
No? Okay. So, uh, oh, well, uh, uh, well, just uh, Alma saying that would be great if you can share, please. So that's, uh, thank you very much for that, Alma. Uh, right. Uh, any, Keith? anyone's, uh, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, then feel, feel please feel to reach, uh, free to reach out on, you know, just contact me via email if you want. Uh, it's absolutely fine. I'm happy to provide any, any uh, follow up uh, assistance or queries. Um, just get in touch. Brilliant. So if we don't have any more questions, I would like to ask Matt, uh, is there a possibility for uh, Keith, since we have about 18 minutes left for those who would like to stay, uh, to uh, maybe just show how he can play the clips and share the sound of the clip without uh, any mishaps with other sound, please. Uh, certainly, Keith. I think you said that you'd um, mostly sorted the issue earlier, where you 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 checked the the desktop audio. I think you might have just had some app running in the background, yeah. like in Spotify or something. Uh, oh, really? Ah, right. It, yeah, okay. It, yeah. It, 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 it sounded like the verb, so you know, I can't totally. Uh, <laughs> Has everyone listened to the verb before? Yeah, I, 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 can't, I can't. I can't totally discredit your choice of music. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was what was going on then. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's interesting. Uh, um, as well. So Keith, uh, I was thinking of uh, of the first uh, uh, clip uh, on dementia, for example, that was really interesting. If you would like to play that to us. Yes, okay. Um, and, and Steve Davis says at least it wasn't Coldplay. <laughs> oh God, he wants Coldplay. <laughs> and Costa is saying thank you very much. Yeah, there's, I think there's a joke around Coldplay somewhere there. <laughs> uh, something to do with Nazis and Coldplay with a peep show or something. I don't know what that is. But, uh, um, let's have a look. Okay. Uh, the, the, men, uh, the, the, the clip uh, in relation to dementia. For... Yeah, okay, that's a good one. Yeah, I'll um, do that. So if I go to share screen and then if I go to share audio, tick share computer sound it's really weird because i can't hear it see so it just sounds like i'm not hearing anything uh if i go to share i'll play this a little bit uh tell me if you can't hear it laura will be over soon let's get you home ah okay yes that will be nice hello he's always on that thing yes oh hi thanks for calling me back um yes it's just about the con ramifications of that yeah but at what point well i can get on and is that going to be difficult or...? Sure, there's the garden with the white flowers. Red flowers. Beautiful. Ah, oh, there's that orange car. It's always parked there. Horrible colour. I can take this cut through back home. Hang on. Hang on. This isn't the right cut through. This isn't the alleyway. Where does this go? This isn't right. Oh, Joe. Joe. Where is Joe? Oh, that's Joe. Oh. Is it? Ah. Uh, Joe? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, you, you've, uh, you've mistaken me for somebody else. Uh, you all right? Can I help? Uh, I'm really sorry. We're, we're together. Oh, right. OK. Well, no worries, eh? Th thanks for your help. Cheers. Where have you been? I was talking on the phone when I turned around. You weren't there. I was so worried. Are you OK? Yes, yes, I'm OK. Come on, let's get you home. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I paused it about there. Um, what a terrible son. Just leaves his mum, you know, what's going on there. I just just abandoned my mother. Uh, Can you give us some context on this clip since sure. it was the beginning of the presentation? Yeah, no problem. So uh, I watched this in Manchester, actually, in I think in about 2016 at the Manchester Festival and the Town Hall. There's a company that um, made this piece. Um, I mean, I won't, I won't necessarily go for the YouTube comments because if anything, they're, they're just... Um, 
not great um, things to, to gauge. So some people are interested in though saying that it works for this type of um, condition and some people are saying it doesn't. Um, but the company, when I spoke to them, they, they were saying that um, they approached um, the science uh, around dementia and the, the uh, I guess, the ailments, uh, for want of a better word, that you, you actually experience if you have dementia. And the idea around creation of this experience is that you're taking on the role of you know, and your son's taking you for a walk and you're having confusion. That's one of the, one of the um, things that you experience with dementia. And in, the, in this example, as you've just seen, she can't recognize her own son and then the ground starts trying to simulate um, what it is to feel the, those sensations in the way. What works particularly well in this example, or why this example works, is because the people who made this talk about um, the idea. You're, you're cutting out a bit with your voice for some um, reason. I think it's because you still right. have it. Yeah. Is it there now? Now it's fine. Okay. Um, so the example cited is, is good because the people who made it have thought about the technological uh, rationale behind making this piece of media before they've actually done it. So they thought about making the experience uh, that allows you to feel what it's like to be someone with dementia. And when I spoke to them in about 2016, they explained the scientific research they'd done to actually um, create the works. They'd look at they'd looked at um, what some of the symptoms of dementia were and um, some of the sensations or um, ailments that you, you experience if you have dementia. So I thought it was really interesting in that respect. I thought what was interesting as well is that they've used a pretty lo-fi technology to create this, this experience. They've just basically used a 360 camera and they've uh, created a shroud around the person fil filming the experience. But what they were able to do is to tap into the, these ideas of embodiment and actually being in a space without actually using um, very expensive technology um, but because they they'd thought about what they were doing before they'd done it and they'd approached the creation of this this piece of work that um, was to the strength of the medium and that's that's why i cite this example is because um they they it's demonstrating a, a good approach to and the creation of your own media. You might not like it personally. Everyone's different. You know, you might think, oh, well, you should have shown something different, which is fine. But um, the, the example does demonstrate a clear thought and rationale to actually creating the media as opposed to just creating it for the sake of it. Great. Thank you, Keith. Uh, now, uh, is there any other clip that you would like to show us? Yeah, sure. I think I've got um, the other one as well. Um, yeah, I've got the, I'll show you this one as well. I'll share the screen and I have to remember to come back and turn my mic off while I, it's so fidgety Zoom sometimes. Um, let's have a look. Share computer sound. Share. Okay, so I'll play a bit of this. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I have to stop, stop sharing <laughs> before I do that. So this is Square Pusher Store Eagles. Um, this is a CGI world, so it's a bit different from the other example. So they've, uh, it looks like they've probably used Unity or something, game engine technology, to create this experience. Uh, but this is, the, this works well, I feel, because um, a you, you're actually physically inside a character. So when you look down, you feel like you're embodying this um, kind of weird creature with a head, headless torso, <laughs> um, and also the um, watch for the people and experience waving to you. And that subtle thing actually is very clever because what they're doing is it's like making you feel like, oh, people are waving to me. I'm part of this experience. It's just a very, very uh, subtle thing that actually when you experience it in VR, it makes you feel more connected to it. I'll play the example and uh, I'll, I'll give you, um, should give you a better idea of what I mean. So I'll just bear me a moment. I'll turn this back on with sound.
I'll pause it there. Uh, I don't want to spoil it. It's worth tr- it's worth trying out if you've got access to a VR headset. Anyone who's um, actually on this call today and is interested in in this technology, if you've got um, something you want to buy, maybe you're thinking about a console or a Black Friday deal, um, you can get the VR Oculus Quest 2 headset for approximately £299. And that'll give you an access access to loads of free content um, with this technology. I, w- I would highly recommend that. Obviously, um, everyone's different. But if you haven't got that sort of cash line around, then it'll give you access to, to loads of um, immersive experiences. A lot of the examples I've shown today are available on Oculus Quest. Uh, that example is available on Oculus Quest. Um, as is the uh, walk through dementia and um, some of the other traveling while black as well that's available on oculus quest as well so there's uh, there's this you know there's loads of stuff going on in that uh, thank you so much keith um just to ask now uh, matt are you there mm-hmm. uh, yeah yeah so uh where will the um um the presentation be available for the audience and also um what other stuff did we want to present uh yeah 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 the recording of the of the event where will people be able to access those so uh after the event uh keith if you send me your presentation and any links that are there i will circulate those to the mailing list and everybody attending here i'm also going to over the next week or so uh, edit the recording of the presentation uh, and upload it to the digital futures youtube page uh, and the digital futures website so it will be accessible it'll probably take me about a week or so to be able to do that but once it's done i will circulate that to the mailing list and um, we are also creating our own uh, um... VR uh, at Manchester website uh, mm-hmm. that is now growing, so it will be available there as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, thank you so much, Matt, for your support through the Digital Futures platform and uh, to Keith for your uh, great presentation and also to all the wonderful audience and your interesting questions. And I'm really looking forward to uh, our next presentation for VR at Manchester, whenever it might be. And we will make sure to uh, reach out to you through Matt and Digital Futures. Uh, So thank you very much for today. And uh, I wish you a great weekend, everyone. And maybe if Matt and Keith could uh, stay on. Uh, after the audience has left us. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone for attending as well. Um, Really great questions and uh, it's been a pleasure to share that information. Hopefully you all have a good Christmas, stay safe, don't catch COVID and uh, see you on the other side. (laughs) On the right side. (laughs) Yeah.